Good afternoon, everybody. Um, very excited to be here. My name is uh, Mikkel Svane. That's originally a Danish name, and Danish pronounced Mikkel Svane. Uh, and I am uh, one of the founders and the CEO of Sendesk. And on my right, I have. I'm Devdat Yalurka. I'm a partner at a venture firm called CRV. I was here just a half an hour ago. So if you guys have not rotated out, we are an early stage venture capital firm. And um, the reason we're here together is because um, uh, Devdut led the Series A in uh, Sendesk when we uh, first moved to the US back in 2009. Um, we were a Danish company, and Denmark is not the most, um, it's not exactly the, the most interesting economy to build a tech startup in. And we wanted to get to the US where the action was. And, um, but this, again, like we pitched in 2008, where uh, it was a very different time than it is today. You didn't have conferences like this. There was absolutely no VC money. You just had the credit crunch. But uh, we did find a partner in uh, Charles River. Yeah, you know, um, so how many of you all have lived through, first of all, how many of you all are entrepreneurs? That's good. Great. And how many of y'all lived through the 2008 crisis as entrepreneurs? Oh, wow, amazing. So you know what it was like. You know, it was you know, uh, a well-known venture capital firm had put out a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation called it RIP Good Times. Right? It was over, Lehman had crashed, uh, the world was kind of completely falling apart. And I was a recovering entrepreneur trying to masquerade as a VC. And that was my, you know, I joined a venture capital firm and tried to become a VC in 2008. How dumb is that? It was like the, the at that time, it, you know, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious because no, there was no money going anywhere at that point. And, and, and we were three guys that uh, knew very little about <laughs> building an enterprise software company. Uh, today, Sendesk is a public company. We went public last year. Uh, we are 900 people or something like that in the organization. But back then, we knew absolutely nothing. And then we met a VC that knew absolutely nothing either. Um, but we all pretended like we knew what we were doing. That's right. <laughs> and it's always like that. You know, I, I think uh, some of you who have raised capital will know. I have raised capital as an entrepreneur. We think we know what we're doing, and we put up a very brave front in front of VCs because we are peddling like crazy underwater just to make sure that everything is working together. And the VC on the other side, you feel, knows everything because they have a little bit of money. They don't know shit. You know, they're sitting there trying to figure out whether the bet with these three guys is ever going to work out. You know, they, they don't know much. You know, as entrepreneurs, you know much, much more than what a VC will ever know. And sometimes that's not a lot. <laughs> Um, but basically, like, um, David was doing some research on some other companies yeah. and stumbled upon Sendesk. We had launched, we were live, we had customers, um, and somehow you found my phone number. So tell, tell, tell us, how, how, did, how did you come up with the idea of Zendesk? Um, yeah, so Zendesk is a customer service software company. Uh, do we have anybody in the audience actually using Zendesk? Oh, wow. Fantastic. Fantastic. For the rest of you, uh, I take credit cards um, out in the bag afterwards. But it's, a, it's just a great tool for really making it very easy and elegant for your customers to engage with you. Um, and we, a couple of us, had been in the industry for a few years and just wanted to build a, a much more beautiful system. This was not, like, nobody really cared about customer service back then. And we wanted to make it sexy and fun again. Um, so we built that system, and we just put it out there. We didn't have a business plan. <laughs> um, and it was impossible for us to raise money in Europe. But then one evening... You know, what happened was, so I just joined this venture firm. And, you know, it's one of the best venture firms in the country. And um, there was a senior partner in our partnership who was looking at help desk technology. And, uh, you know, I just joined. I was like the 45-year-old go gopher didn't know much about venture. He said, I'm going to make an investment in this company. Can you find out you know, who competes with them? And then I went online. You know, I was kind of a little uh, net savvy. I went, to, went, went on Google. I found there were like 200 companies 
all were doing some kind of help desk, customer support, blah, blah, blah. And um, you know, one thing that I found, and the signal that I found was that, in all that noise, was that there was this company called Zendesk that was, had, a, for some reason, a lot of online love. People were talking about it online. And I remember, you know, we were first investors in Twitter, and Twitter had just bought a search engine called Summize, and they had implemented it. And at that time, search sucked. I mean, even now it's pretty bad, but then it was really bad. And I searched for Zendesk on Twitter, and all I could see was like, I love this thing, I love this thing, this is fantastic. So I said, you know, I need to, I need to find this thing out, and I need to figure out who this company is and what they do. And I, again, I didn't know anybody at Zendesk, so I went online, tried to search for Mikkel's phone number online, did a reverse lookup, no, I didn't. I didn't. But I found it online. So, you know, he had made the mistake of leaving a phone, his phone number behind with some conference. I got hold of him and I called him. And on Halloween night, was it Halloween night or thing? I flew over to Copenhagen to meet uh, to meet these two these three guys. And we were <laughs> we were working out of my co-founder Alexander's kitchen. <laughs> um, so like it was fifth floor of a residential building. It was old, like old, old Copenhagen. The building is like 150 years old. And these crooked stairs, and we were up there, top floor, fifth floor, uh, working in his kitchen. And that's, that's where we invited uh, Devdo to come, to come visit us. So, you know, the, you, know, the th you know, so we're talking about mega trends, right? So let me tell you what some of the three trends that I saw that were different this is now five years ago, that today defines SaaS. And the reason why we are here is saying that this is going to go through one more ship that's just coming and he's right in the middle of that ship and he'll talk more about it. But the, the, the stuff that we saw was that they were selling enterprise software, that time business software, completely online. Like I said, give me your credit card, right? It was like e-commerce of business software, never been done before. Second was it had a very beautiful look and feel. It was, every, it was designed for the customer. It was not designed for the buyer. And the third was it was completely cloud native. It was built for the cloud. This is now going back 2008, right? Cloud was, I don't even think AWS was pretty big. They were, they were, you were using Engineer at that time. You know, so it was all these trends were new that now we know, you know, I'm sure all you entrepreneurs who are writing any application those are the three tenants you have. So how did you come up with the, these three ideas? <laughs> well, <laughs> I think with, I, you know, I think it was a combination. We were three founders. And I'm, I'm, I'm probably one of the founders who's like the most impatient and wanted to get shit done and make sure that we actually build some software. But like, we like, you know, have three very different qualities. One is in the, you know, Alex is incredibly aesthetic um, and, and caring and, and hates the enterprise space, just hates enterprise software. So he models everything up after like a consumer experience, consumer software. And, 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 and that has modeled us in many ways. And uh, Morton, of course, is a technologist, is, is, is um, embracing the new technology. So that is kind of the, that is the trifecta that you have to bring together to build kind of what is not today but what hopefully will be the future but I think like one of the things that that was disruptive for us and that we haven't we didn't really make a plan for it but it's something that has been tremendously um, valuable and actually determined our path and our future it is that we primarily we make our business by disrupting traditional sales processes so that means that all of you guys out here who are our customers today you are our most valuable asset, not only from a revenue perspective, but from a marketing perspective. The more we invest in giving you guys a great experience, the more new business we're getting. We have like 65% of our online leads come to us primarily through word of mouth. And that's just like, that's something you normally know from the world of consumer software. 
you know, like you're using Uber, you're using Airbnb, not because they have sold to you, but because somebody else told you that actually that's really, really good. That's a great, great service. And that's why you're using it. And we are seeing that paradigm shift in the world of enterprise software too, that it's, ex it's all about giving customers a great experience because then they'll go out and share it. And that is very much kind of the, the, the function of the promoter economy. And, and I think that is changing the entire enterprise software business today. So, you know, you were in Copenhagen. We made the condition that we'll invest only if you move to the US. <laughs> very subtle. So why did you move? Well, I think we, we wanted to move to the US. Um, and I think that's, you know, Denmark is an incredibly small economy. We have, we have five, six million people. Um, I, at back then, there weren't really a VC. There's no VC market. And we knew the action was in the US. We knew the action was in California. Um, and um, because that's where you have the talents, that's where you have all the access to capital, access to all the business development opportunities. That's where you kind of have the, the hustle and the bustle, the flow, that's where everything is happening. So that was very natural for us to come in and be part of that whole ecosystem to help grow the company rapidly. Because truth is that you can build a startup everywhere in the world. But if you really want to scale that saga, uh, California, San Francisco, Silicon Valley is just the best way to do it. So, you know, by the way, Mikkel's written a fantastic book called Startup Land. If, if you guys have not read it, I'm sure he'll sell you copies online. Online. Yeah. We have a booth out here that has a few of the exam uh, few samples of the book too. So what, you know, I, I've known the company since you were three people, now you're 900 people, you were less than a million dollars in revenue, now you're a publicly held, I, one of the darlings of, this comp of the industry, of the SaaS space. Tell us about the journey, the three things that, you know, were the trends that put you on the map. Well, I think that, I think we, we talked a lot about, you mentioned some of it that kind of helped us move to where the market would be. Um, and I think what we think more and more about today is where, where's the market going to be in the future? Um, so what about branding? You know, most enterprise software companies don't think, for them, branding is an afterthought. Yeah, you but, had but I think, branding right up front, right? But I think that's something that, again, like, we stumbled a little bit into it. <laughs> um, and, and, like, building a strong brand is just part of, of building that promoter economy. You want to have your customers to fall in love with the product, and that kind of, that, 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 that also means that they, sometime have, they somehow have to fall in love with the brand. It has to be a brand that they can relate to, that they think is cool, and, and like that they feel like it gives them an aspiration. So brand building is incredibly important for any kind of relationship. And, and, and more and more enterprise software companies are definitely embracing that. The other trend you, you uh, wrote was build for the user, not for the buyer. Yeah. Right? So yeah. where did you get that insight? <laughs> I think, again, I think it's like, the whole consumerization of IT, like we are so much used to all these different applications that are on our iPhones and on our devices that are so easy to use. And like we expect, we start to expect the same thing from our enterprise applications. We don't want to sit with these old green screens and uh, anymore. And I think that that is, that is just a natural path for enterprise software. But I think one of the interesting things that we are looking into and that I know you're interested in too, is kind of starting to explode your applications, not just as an ap application service for users, but exposing it for other applications too. Um, we focus a lot on our API infrastructure. We focus a lot on uh, making, compo de almost de de uh, decomposing the applications into uh, elements that can be embedded naturally through our APIs. Um, and I think that whole API economy is something that, that you're looking into too. And, and, yeah. and I, absolutely. I think that's the new mega trend. Yeah. Right? The mega trend is that SaaS was first consumed primarily on the web using a browser. Now applications are being consumed on devices, on smartphones, on smart watches, inside cars. You know, all the form factors are completely changing. So the only way to kind of build applications today is API first, right? You have to build the API and let the front, the front end be whatever the front end has to be. Sometimes, like I know in Zendesk's case, 
a lot of your customers are using your embeddables as part of their experience, their, your customer's experience. Can you talk about a few customer experience uh, yeah, examples? So, so embeddables is a, is a new uh, uh, series of products we released last year. And basically, it makes it possible for you to embed the customer service experience directly into your product, whether that be a web service, a web app, a mobile app, a actual product or a service. Um, and just like making like making the um, like making the experience immersive so customer service and the customer engagement is not a destination but something that is right there at your fingertips um, is something that we as consumers uh, are starting to expect from the services that we're using and i think we see that you'll see that beyond just customer service but for any type of application the ability to kind of embed it and have it right at your fingertips uh, integrated seamlessly into other services uh, is, is a new trend. You know, the example I liked the most was, Im imagine a game, right? You, if you're a gamer, you'd hate to get out of the game experience to get help. So imagine an uh, avatar uh, of a Zendesk Buddha sitting in the corner that you can ask the question of and get help, right? I think that kind of allowing the game developer to build their own experiences to provide help for their customers is, I think, the future of SaaS. And, and, and it's a good example because gamers, game developers are one of some of the early adopters of this kind of technology. So the second thing that we think about is, uh, you know, kind of big data and how predictive analytics is being used by SaaS companies now. Can you, I know we've got a minute to go. <laughs> well, I think that if you are in the enterprise software space right now, you all know that there is like, there is a big democratization effort going on. Like we try to make things as easy, simple, and as affordable as possible. And that also means there's a big shift in how we're gonna think about the revenue stream going forward. Where it used to be like a seed-based model, it used to be like a license-based model. We will see more and more software going going free basically. You, you're not gonna pay for your workflow systems or your payroll systems or any of these kind of things. They will be free services. But what you really want to as a business is that you want the data, you want the insight, what the application can tell you about the customers, what it can tell you about the markets and the trends. Ultimately in five, five, 10 years time, that will ultimately be the currency that uh, uh, organizations are gonna use when buying uh, applications. One last question, I know we have four seconds to go. There was an article that you had written that I, I didn't know how my wife took it, but you had said, why should uh, treat your VC like a spouse? What the hell was that? <laughs> but that's the thing, like, um, when you raise money, it, you, you think primarily about like getting the cash into your business so that you can continue execute on your vision and your dream. But ultimately, like, you end up you end up in a relationship. You end up with somebody who's in your business and will follow your business for many, many years. Like, we will, we've known each other for almost 10 years now, and we've been talking basically every week. Sometimes I speak more <laughs> with you than I speak with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Not healthy. <laughs> so I think that's the, that's the important thing into when you're raising money, when you're going into that process. Don't think about the money. Think about the person that comes with the money because that's the thing you're going to carry around for the rest of your life literally carry around. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys.